Greetings, everyone. Happy Monday night, February 19th, 2024. Hard to believe we're already through the second month of the year. It's been both the longest and shortest year ever so far. But uh, Anthony Broom here with Clayton Safey here on the Wolverine.com YouTube channel or in your podcast feed after the fact. No Chris Ballas today, but we do have a lot to talk to whether or a lot to talk about. I should say whether it pertains to Juwan Howard and Michigan basketball. The quarterback situation got a little bit of clarity, at least in terms of who will be in the room over the weekend with Jack Tuttle announcing that he'll come back. And then as we do every Monday night, uh, we will also end with your questions. But before we do that, Clayton, welcome. Uh, it's good to be back after a week off. Yeah, welcome back. Um, we got a decent amount to get to, and I'm sure some great questions. So great to be here as always. Well, before we get into the meat and potatoes of our show, we do want to let you guys know again, uh, pre-orders have shipped for our Wolverine magazine commemorative issue uh, of, uh, I don't know if they've shipped, but they are, it was sent off and out in the wild. That magazine is, uh, should be in your mailboxes shortly. If you ordered the soft cover edition, uh, hard covers will go out sometime in March, but uh, we do have, as you know, a commemorative edition of the Wolverine magazine celebrating Michigan's 15 and 0 season and national championship. Uh, it's 148 full color glossy pages. It's $14.95 plus $5 shipping per copy. Uh, those are going to go out, like I said, soon. Uh, it's got in-depth features on Jim Harbaugh, Blake Corum, JJ McCarthy, and more. You've got exclusive highlights on a lot of different aspects of the season, game by game coverage. It was fun to revisit a lot of that and a lot of great original photography from our staff, column stats, and much more. So again, uh, those will, if you pre-ordered, those will ship out soon. Uh, if you didn't, uh, we will, all orders after February 8th, which that was obviously 11 days ago, will be shipped in March when uh, we receive our full inventory. But the book is done. It's off. It's been off to the presses and whatnot. So uh, that should start popping up in your mailboxes soon. So a lot of fun to work on. So head on over to thewolverine.com or thewolverineondemand.com and get your order today if you have not done so yet. All right, Clayton, uh, let's start with Michigan basketball because how do I how do I word this delicately? Um, I don't know if Saturday's loss to Michigan State was a bottoming out because really I think it's pretty telling that when your rival comes to your arena and I won't say takeover, there were a couple thousand Spartan fans there and there always are, but to loot, to not score the last seven minutes of a game to have an opposing fan base come in and chant at Doug McDaniel to do his homework, chant the go green, go white. That was pretty darn loud and not even have those things be in the top five, top 10, top, whatever most disheartening things of this season is pretty telling uh, to me on where this campaign has gone and where we'll start tonight is where we're at with Juwan Howard, because Again, I, I think for weeks, uh, there's been a lot of angst. There's been a lot of anger towards the direction of this program, which the direction being rock bottom and seemingly still finding ways to reach new lows, whether it be 30-point losses on the road, you know, disheartening games where you you blow an opportunity at home. Um, you know, I, I know we're kind of – we're getting to the point in March where – or in February where this is um, – this is where you secure your postseason future. And Michigan hasn't had one. Haven't, you know, season was arguably over before the new year even started. So when we get to the conversation about what Jawan Howard's future is, and I I guess I'll just because I, I do have some things to say about it, but you know, while I uh formulate maybe a nicer way to say them, Clayton, just where are you at now with all of this? Because it's not not only is it not getting better, it's getting worse in a lot of areas, and I really do question especially when you hear Ward Manuel come out last week and say, you know, he hasn't thought about making a change focused on supporting Juwan Howard and Michigan basketball. Um, I mean, just where are we at with the state of this program? Because I got to be honest, I'm, I'm really, and it's been this way a while, for a while for me, I'm really having a hard time seeing a path forward here. Yeah. Well, our Chris Ballas and I talked about Ward Manuel's comments last week and, you know, I didn't read much into those because look, I mean, what's he supposed to say? I thought, you know, it, it's, He's not going to say he's going to fire him if they lose on Saturday. He said uh, the comments were on Wednesday, I believe. You know, he's not going to he's not going to come out and say if they don't win four or five of their next however many games, he's gone. Or if they don't win the Big Ten tournament, I mean, 
basically he's always been a guy who evaluates at the end of the season. I don't think this is going to be any different. I know we've seen a couple changes throughout the country, including with Michigan's rival, Ohio State, going with Chris Holtman. They uh, Diebler, the interim coach, they beat Purdue the other day. So maybe you could look at that and be like, hey, maybe uh, you know, maybe you can get that interim bump or whatever. But no, I, I don't see anything happening before the end of the year. They still have five regular season games left. They're going to play in the uh, you know first set of games, likely as the 14 seed on the Wednesday night in the Big Ten tournament in Minneapolis. And obviously that gives you an opportunity to to at least do something. We saw Ohio State do something with that opportunity a year ago with Chris Holtman. Now they didn't turn it around this year, but they were, uh, you know, they got a little bit more back on track a year ago. I wouldn't predict that from this Michigan team, um, you know, but uh, you know, to me, it's, it's not that things are getting worse or, you know, they might get a little better. It's that they're staying the same and, and that it's been really bad all season long. And I mean, I know they're going to get Doug McDaniel back on the road in a couple games that will certainly help their chances to pick up a win or two. Uh, at the end of the year, but I mean, schedule still in that tough part of the year with Purdue uh, over the weekend. You got to go to Northwestern on Thursday night, so it's challenging, and it's challenging to win games when you don't score in the last seven minutes. It's challenging to win games when you turn it over twenty-two times. I mean, in the last seven minutes, really, or the nine possessions following Michigan tying the game up at sixty-three, sixty-three, they had five turnovers. Two missed, uh, you know, forced long jump shots. One of them was a long two. The other one was a, a step back three from Doug McDaniel. Uh, and then uh, then they missed. The Will Cheddar three was one of those. Uh, and I can't remember. Oh, no, Doug. Yeah, Doug rushed in and, and missed a layup as well. Those are your nine possessions after you tied the game. And you really had an opportunity to win that one against a Michigan State team that's playing pretty good. So I thought that was extremely disappointing. Um, you know, they have not played well in second halves for a while now. So it wasn't necessarily surprising to me, but you had an opportunity there, even with all the turnovers that you were committing all game long and to squander it like that was, uh, you know, was just really tough um, because nothing was going to make their season at this point, short of maybe winning the big 10 tournament and getting into the big dance, but winning any game, like we saw against Wisconsin the week before, you know, especially against a good team, can help your spirits at least as they try to salvage what's left. Yeah. I, I think the most damning thing to me about that game, like I said earlier, is that it, nothing about it was surprising and that, you know, being swept by your rival in a regular season is, is not it's the first time that's happened since uh, 2018, 2019, when they played three times and played in that big 10 tournament uh, final in Chicago. But, you know, for me, you know, when you sit there and you listen to Juwan speak, um, something that stuck out to me from that that post game the other night was, you know, he says we do have experience and we have guys that are new and have played together for a few months. It takes time to build chemistry. And to me, it, you know, if you if you're fielding a roster full of true freshmen and sophomores that are still learning how to play the game, that's one thing. But Doug McDaniel, listen, I know he's missed big stretches of this season due to his suspension, which again, that's that's something he has to wear, and, and quite frankly. The program has to wear because there are those resources there to help you stay academically eligible. But, um, you know, he's a guy that played almost all of last year. Um, Namari Burnett, I know he hasn't started, a, you know, hasn't been healthy a ton in college, but he's a guy that's been in college for four or five years. And Olivier Kamwa has been in college and Terrace Reed, you know, is, is nearing the end of his sophomore year. And again, to me, he's been one of, if not the only bright spots this year, um, at least in terms of his consistency, which this team lacks is consistency. Um, you know, there are guys on this roster that they, they only have the one true freshman in George Washington. And he's just not ready to play yet. So when you, when you're a guy, when you are the guy who's in charge of shopping for the groceries and putting the roster together. And, and again, you know, I have a ton of sympathy for, you know, the heart surgery and the recovery from that. I know that's, that's extremely difficult no matter what people said about it. I mean, that is uh you know, that's, that's a burden and that's something that he has to deal with. And, and he's still doing physical therapy and recovery from that. But, um, you know, another quote that stuck out to me, you know, if I crack, if I explode, that's going to trickle down to the players. I enjoy coaching them. We are always looking to improve. I've never run or quit in my life. Every time and everywhere I've been, I've rolled up my sleeves and found solutions. And again, he's talking about, you know, finding solutions to better this program moving forward. What about finding the solutions now? Because I don't see them making a whole lot of adjustments. I don't, um, you know, they just don't do anything 
with much conviction at all. And, and I'm not, I'm trying not to beat a dead horse here, but you know, even dating back to early January, it, it's felt like we are spiraling towards what is a needed leadership change. And, and that ultimately is a decision that's going to find, you know, fall on the man above him in ward manual fall on that Michigan administration. And I think given the way recent events have, have turned out, I question if he has the conviction to make a difficult decision because it's it's an administration that a lot of times has hit the easy button, whether it be um, you know, just on a number of fronts, and then being you know that reactive instead of proactive. So to me, you know, the the idea that Juwan could do you know they could do what they did with Jim Harbaugh and reboot the entire program except for Juwan Howard and, and have that work the way it did. I think that's. To me, that's that would be administrative hubris. I really do, because Jim Harbaugh is a unique guy with a track record of turning, you know, winning programs. And Juwan, the further away we get from his success, the worse it's gotten, and that's that's troubling to me. Um, and again, I and I don't want to pile on the guy, but this is college basketball. This isn't a feel good story. This is the University of Michigan. This is the Big Ten. You know, people pay too much money to go to these games to make that investment now, and and it's diminishing returns each night out, which is disappointing. Yeah. And the thing the his comment about experience and how it takes time for them to mesh together. Like he said that on February 18th at, you know, what, 10 35 PM. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like the, that's when you're supposed to be rounding into form and playing your best basketball. And I, I know, I mean, yeah, he shopped for the groceries or however you want to say it, but he also tried to get some, things and and got denied at the register too right when, when you look at transfer restrictions over the last couple of years if they had Terrence Shannon on this roster I think things would be a lot different now you you know blame falls on the coaching staff as well for not vetting that beforehand and putting your eggs in certain baskets that were never going to be able to um to come to fruition so it's not like blame is is you know solely on Juwan Howard or solely on admissions or solely on anything but uh, you know, things just nece- uh, haven't necessarily worked out the way they would have wanted them to. And yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see what Ward Manuel does after the season. He's not exactly a guy who's who's known to be super proactive and take charge. Um, you know, he's kind of been a pretty passive leader, it seems like, over his years. I think we have a big enough sample size now to to be able to say that. You know, he's obviously made some good moves. He's, you know, there have been some mistakes by the athletic department as well that, you know, we've talked about throughout the years. So I'm interested to see, you know, kind of what happens there um but yeah it's got to be tough and i don't know what how much you can really do if you're that staff right now towards the end of the year i mean you just kind of keep coaching i know you don't have a ton of young guys to develop but the obvious follow-up to his comment about how things you know it takes time for these guys to come together is well look at the roster and look how many guys are either out of eligibility or going to move on after this season what makes you think that next year would be any different now I think Juwan makes that comment knowing that he doesn't have the talent either that he would like, which is an issue. And he's not going to say that, that they don't have talent. So part of it, I think is coach speak and and you can't, you know, take too much stock into it. So not that he says a lot anyway, most of what he says is coach speak and basically, you know, talking without saying a ton, uh, like a lot of coaches. So, um, you know, that, to me, but it it just makes you think like, man, well, how is next year going to be any different when you lose likely Olivier Kamwa, Namari Burnett. I mean, you could lose other guys in the transfer portal. Um, You know, you could, you could lose uh, Terrence Williams. He has an extra year of eligibility. You didn't have him on Saturday too, which I thought hurt and they ran out of gas. You had to see Trey Jackson uh, play for 12 minutes. Michigan state outscored. (laughs) You had to see him play for 12 minutes and in those 12 minutes, (laughs) Michigan State won by uh, those 12 minutes by 14 points, which is pretty hard to do. So it's almost impressive in a way. But yeah, uh, that's my rambling. Those are my rambling thoughts. I guess my my question would be this. Uh, you know, you're and again, it's impossible for us to put ourselves in this position. But, you know, let's just say you are someone that is in charge of of gauging what what an extra year might look like. Is there anything that they because it, it certainly hasn't been done, you know, throughout this season. But is there anything that they can do in these next five? It, six, it'll be six games, maybe seven, if they win their Wednesday night game uh, in Minneapolis, which is certainly possible. But you know, is there anything they can do short of 
gosh, winning a Big Ten tournament and and somehow getting into the NCAs that you could even label as something to hang your hat on moving forward because this isn't just you know this isn't like the COVID season in 2020 for football. That was a Mickey Mouse campaign that had a lot of issues that led to that, and there were some major questions to answer. But this is a total and complete bottoming out of the program. And you look at the roster and and what is there to build on? What is there to, what could you even take out of this season to build for next year? Yeah. So for me, when I look at, you know, potentially letting coaches go and, and all this, I don't look at it as a punishment for, you know, losing and, and, you know, having, you know, seasons that didn't work or, or whatever it might be, or, you know, losing a couple games that you shouldn't have, or, or something like that. Like, like is the reaction on social media and throughout fan bases and will always go on and right. And a lot of that interest and the passion from the fan base drives the business. So, you know, I'm certainly not complaining as somebody who's getting a paycheck, you know, working in college sports. Um, but I look at it as, okay, what are, what are the solutions to fix Michigan basketball? They're, they're eight and 18, right? I mean, something has to change. And I do think, you know, it would, uh, it would be a positive. And I think Juwan Howard's probably thinking, okay, let's win, the rest of the games here. Let's make a run in the Big Ten tournament again. You know, mentioned Chris Holtman in Ohio State kind of did that at the end of last year, winning some games, and you know, gave them what they felt like at least was a little bit of momentum. But at the end of the day, what are you going to do in the future? I'm looking for solutions, and you know, you could think that Jawan Howard is the right guy to you know continue that. That's that's you know, there's an argument to be made for anything, uh, but I don't know that anything in the last six plus games is going to convince me that anything would be different with what's going to happen in the future, positive or negative. Right. Um, so, you know, they could lose the rest of these games and I don't think it would, it would do anything and they could win the rest. And I think that certainly he would probably have a little bit more support, but ultimately it's about what you're going to do in the future after the season, because this season's basically wasted already. And, you know, so I don't, again, I, I just don't think it's going to change yeah. what I would feel about it or, or what, what's going to happen. Right. So you look at the rest of the schedule here, you know, they've got Northwestern on Thursday night. Uh, I mean, Ken Palm has all of these as losses. And again, Northwestern now would Northwestern be the last road game without Doug McDaniel? It should be. Yeah. Cause then they'll be on spring break and you know, apparently the six games is up according to Doug, okay. but they didn't put a timeline in Juwan statement, which makes me think, you know, maybe that he's not going to go to Minneapolis. I think that's something that we need to ask about in a couple of weeks. Yeah. For sure. I mean, at Northwestern Thursday, again, they have Purdue on Sunday. Um, that feels like a death march. Just need to call that what it is. Uh, go to Rutgers a week from Thursday uh, for a revenge game with them. Then you end at Ohio State and at home against Nebraska on March 10th. So, again, you know, I, I think in the rosiest of – again, this Big Ten kind of stinks too. So, you could win a couple games there. You could lose them all. I don't think you win them all, but – Who's to say? But again, I mean the the, the I, lack of yeah. Go ahead. I think that the end of the schedule here is not that bad outside of Purdue. Like I wouldn't be totally shocked. I mean, we're doing the schedule game, which everyone loves to do. I wouldn't be completely shocked if they were competitive on Thursday against Northwestern. They don't have Ty Berry the rest of the year. I know they they've been winning, you know, at a decent clip even recently. But Rutgers, Ohio State, Nebraska, and you're going to have Doug in all those games. Again, he's no All-American. He's not even an All-Big Ten caliber player. But he he does change what this team looks like on the floor. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are opportunities for a couple wins. Ken Palm has them losing all those games individually, but they also have them winning one more at some point, right? If you have, like, four or five games that you're 49% chance of, of uh, winning, you know, you're actually projected to win one or two of those. Um, it's not 49% in, in each game, but – they have them winning one more. I think they could win one or two, but I just don't think it makes any difference. It's the race to 10, baby. That's where we are in year five. Double so, digits. Okay. Well, that's enough of disheartening hoops talk. Uh, let's move into football uh, because there was some, and again, I, I won't say news that shakes up the trajectory of the 2024 Wolverines, uh, which we're starting to, things are starting to come into focus now. I know I picked a, maybe a bad week to take off last week with a lot of, assistant coaching hires coming into focus, but that staff pretty much done outside of waiting to see what happened at running back, but uh, on the field quarterback, maybe the, the most consequential position battle that this team will have uh, in the spring, certainly in fall camp, 
as we try to determine what this team's ceiling is in 2024 in Sharon Moore's first year. Big piece of the puzzle back now in uh, Jack Tuttle, who gets a seventh year of eligibility, which is, uh, that's just kind of nuts, but circumstantially, that's the position that he finds himself in. And again, uh, Jack Tuttle is a guy that I think, regardless, was going to be back with this program, either as a player or as a grad assistant. That's something that they had talked about at the end of last year. And you know now he is going to be back. And I assume that he does factor into that quarterback battle, which as of now would be Jack Tuttle, uh, Alex Orgy, Jaden Denegal, Davis Warren, and outside shot that maybe Jaden Davis has a nice off season here and, and makes a push for it in fall camp. But uh, you know, what I wanted to hit on uh, first off is let's talk the impact of it. I mean, Jack Tuttle is a guy you, you look at, you know, he's played college football for six years, doesn't have a ton of starting experience. Uh, it came at Indiana, which, you know, always comes with a bit of an asterisk because that's one of the lesser teams in the big 10. Uh, but Jack Tuttle in general, Clayton, what do you feel like he does for this room? Because I think at, the, at least he's the guy that will compete for the starting job. And at worst, it's a guy who is a veteran presence. That's almost like a de facto coach on the field that has the, you know, solid backup upside as well. Well, first of all, I'm somewhat surprised that one, he got this waiver granted and two, that it came this quickly. I mean, it's, it makes sense that the NCAA is, you know, I mean, for all their faults, you would think that they would try to get this done before spring ball. And they did, you know, so I give him credit for giving him an answer. Cause there are guys that, I mean, there was what the North Carolina receiver went into last year waiting on a waiver right into the season. And then it got denied mid year. So, you know, at least that they have this answer now, but um, you know, because 2022 is the year that he was trying to get it for. And the injury happened in the back half of the season. It's supposed to happen in the first half. They make exceptions and they made one here. I think it's it's pretty significant for Michigan. I mean, Jack Tuttle told me in, in late December when we were at the Rose Bowl Media Day that he was going to try to stay on as a coach either way. So he would have been around. Uh, but having him as a player in the role that he had last year and from when you talk to people, you know, the impact he had on J.J. McCarthy and the quarterback room in general as kind of like you said, a, you know, a coach or, you know, but he was also the backup. You know, he provided depth and he has experience and he has started five games in the Big Ten. So he brings that value as well. So I think to have him in the quarterback room with Kirk Campbell, who's now the offensive coordinator, is going to be big. Uh, he's got more responsibility now. Uh, but Jack Tuttle is is going to compete for the starting job. And I mean, I would put him right near the top like he's. He's at the top of the depth chart from last year among the guys that are returning. So he doesn't necessarily have the upside maybe that an Alex Orgy would or somebody else emerging in that group of guys that you mentioned. Uh, but you kind of know what he is. He has experience. Um, he has started in the past. I thought he improved from when we saw him in the spring to you know bits and pieces of when we saw him in the fall at Michigan and will continue to. Um, and he's what, 24, 25 years old at this point. Um, I, I say that without researching it and I should have before we came on here, but, uh, that's valuable too. Maybe he will, you know, become something that he, he hadn't been before. I mean, last time he started games, it was at Indiana a couple years ago and then even more so the year before that. So that was a while ago at this point, it's going to be fall of four, uh, 2024 coming up and he could be, uh, improved from, the different times that we saw him start throughout his career at Indiana. So I think it's big. Um, it's nice for Michigan. I still think that you would try to get a, a transfer in the spring period, but it does not hurt one bit to have a guy like this back in the room and, you know, with eligibility where you could put him on the field. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at Jack Tuttle, this is a guy who leads a room that, you know, when I talked to Kirk Campbell uh, while we were, when we were in Houston, he had said, you know, everyone in that room, you know, whether it be, Tuttle, whether it's Alex Orgy, Denegal, Davis Warren, uh, you know, Kirk Campbell had a direct, obviously as the quarterbacks coach was with those guys most of the time. And, and it could have been coach speak at the time, but I, I take Kirk Campbell's evaluation seriously when he, and, and take his word for it when he says each one of those guys improved last year behind the scenes, which, you know, you're not getting a ton of, if any uh, starting quarterback reps. So there's a lot of work right. you have to do on the scout team. There's a lot of work you have to do with the twos, but you know, I, I think as this quarterback situation comes into focus, Clayton, when you look at what's coming back now, again, you're going to break in an entirely new offensive line, which will be different, but I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt there because 
there are going to be guys there that I think we've seen play before and, and play at a pretty high level. You know, Giovanni El Hadi being one of them. But then you look at the skill guys. Colston Loveland set to be back. Uh, the wide receivers. I think you can kind of talk yourself into being excited for Tyler Morris and Samaj Morgan in bigger roles. And maybe that's a position that they look at in that spring window to, to augment the roster. But I, I think they've got some good pieces there. Obviously at running back, we know what they have coming back with Donovan Edwards, uh, Jordan Marshall, the guy that I think is going to get some time and Cole Cabana, and Benjamin Hall. And, and I think, you know, I, I think it would be, you know, if you're just a fan saying, Oh, well look at Jack Tuttle. He, he's, Started five games, has never looked impressive, and blah, 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 blah. But I think you could make a pretty easy argument that if he were to emerge as the starting guy, and I still don't buy that yet. I, I tend to believe, and I don't know why. I mean, I shouldn't say I don't know why I feel this way. It's just college football now. But I, I tend to lean to the idea that next year's starter is probably enrolled at classes somewhere else right now. Um, but if it is Jack Tuttle, or any of these guys, I think you could talk yourself into them piecing together a pretty, pretty good, pretty efficient offense that maybe doesn't quite have, you know, the explosiveness that last year's did, but, um, you know, I think they can find a way to coach, to coach what they have up and, and make it work throughout the regular season. But, uh, you know, obviously when we talk about college football playoff, we talk about potentially running back national championship, which they are defending national champions until they lose their last game next year. That is something that Michigan can say. Um, I do think that ultimately your best shot at running it back or making some noise again in the college football playoff probably comes with someone via the transfer portal. And we'll see who winds up being available. And quite frankly, um, I would never advocate for tampering or anything like that. But, you know, if someone maybe isn't cur currently available that might be interested in being available, I would hope those overtures would take place behind the scenes too. So, cause that's, what's happening to their players. There are people po trying to poach Michigan guys right now. So, and that's just the college football that we're in. So um, yeah, your thoughts on the room as a whole. I mean, do you think, do you think their starter is on the roster right now? I would lean that it is just because of the unknown of what's going to be available. As you mentioned, um, you know, looking back at last year's cycle, there were there was only one top 15 transfer quarterback in the portal that ended up starting somewhere else uh that entered the portal in the spring excuse me this that ended up starting somewhere else and it was Peyton Thorne at Auburn uh and he was pretty underwhelming I know um you know, going into the Alabama game watching that film you can look at a lot of things he did well in that game running the football but and and give him credit for that but Overall, he was pretty underwhelming. So if it's somebody of that caliber that is, you know, going to be the guy you bring in in the spring who would only have a few months to prepare, it would hard it would be hard for me to predict that that individual would come in. Now, it doesn't mean that just because last year there weren't many impact quarterbacks in the April period uh, that there's not going to be this year. There could be. Um, and as you said, things happen behind the scenes. I mean, the fact that Keon Sab became a, uh, you know, apparently was on Alabama's shortlist within two hours of being in the portal. Makes you mm -hmm. wonder about uh, exactly what goes on behind the scenes. And I know there are back channels. Um, I remember talking to somebody that was talking about Drake Nugent coming in. This is last summer. And before he entered the portal, months before, and this isn't tampering, this is Michigan scouting. Uh, he was, uh, you know, and I think part of it has to do with when you, uh, you know, your coach is going to get fired or, you know, does get fired like they did at Stanford with David Shaw, like they knew about Jack Tuttle and liked his, his game. And then once he entered the portal, it was like, okay, we like this guy. Let's reach out and try to get something done. He ends up being a Remington award finalist at Michigan and a national champion this past year. So stuff like that happens for sure. Where I think if a guy goes in, you got to know if you want him or not. And I think people, you know, have a good idea of what's going to happen with some of these guys around the country. So um, you know, that's, you know, something that I think could be a possibility, but I would lean that right now I would take the, the group of guys Michigan has over this unknown transfer, but that's me saying it really early without knowing who that transfer is. And that's where I think spring ball is critical. I mean, all they're going to have what, at least let's just say conservatively three guys that are probably going to get starting reps, maybe four, uh, it's going to be a true battle. And I think the fact that 
again, a lot of people are speculating that this spring window could be chaos for everyone, not just the guys that maybe were looking to transfer from Michigan during the coaching change, but couldn't because of classes, obviously that, you know, if, if a guy wants to leave, obviously saw with Keon Saab, you can jump into the portal regardless, but I think this whole situation has bought you time. And I think being able to have a spring ball where you go through five, six weeks of truly knowing what you have and maybe not completely knowing what you have, but at least getting an idea of what that pecking order looks like. Um, I think that's huge for them. And that's where, you know, you talk about knowing those guys that might enter the portal and having them scouted. I think that's where operationally, you know, having a guy like Sean McGee now as your GM, you become a little better prepared to, 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 to scout guys, to have an idea of who you might want, should they come available. So um, it, it's going to be interesting. I'm with you. I would still, you know, if you're asking me transfer or the field in terms of the guys that they already have, I'm probably taking the field, um, but we'll see what happens. There's a lot to sort out. Uh, I think that, you know, fundamentally, I think the offense is pretty much going to stay the same, uh, but there are going to be some tweaks and, and they will, they are willing, they're going to be willing to tweak to the skill set of the guy that, that ultimately wins the gig. But, um, you know, if you come out of spring ball and feel pretty good about what you have, I could see them not adding anyone. Um, but again, you know, it's, yeah, you it's just got to know. Where, yeah. We just got to see who's out there. I mean, cause I could see that too, but if there's someone they like, they should, they should go after them. And it's a great opportunity. If you're somebody in the portal to come in, play with this defense, you know, the guys that you do have around you, I do have a prediction for the spring game. I already can't wait for our spring game draft, but I think with the wide receiving core being kind of inexperienced, a little bit thin right now, and the team split up, I have a, a prediction that people are going to be panicking about the quarterback play after the spring game. It's kind of hard to look good with those split up rosters. You don't get the best protection because you have the split offensive line as well, unless they go with a different format, right? Cause we don't know what Sharon Moore spring games look like. So I'm saying that as if they go with what they've done the last couple of years, there will be panic because, Oh, nobody's getting open and they can't protect and they're, you know, whatever. So uh, that's just a, that's just a prediction, but I'm excited to do our mock draft for the spring game already. It'd be a couple months, right? Yeah. Uh, two months from tomorrow. So got to start putting that board together, man. I don't know <laughs> who I'd take first right now. Um, <laughs> But it'll be interesting for sure. Any other thoughts on on these quarterbacks? Uh, again, I, I think I know there's been a lot of freaking out because there has been so much change over the last four or five weeks. But you know, I can I can still talk to myself into this team being pretty darn good. Again, depending on who's available, who stays, who emerges, all of that type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, look, like you have you know the, the Jack Tuttle, his you know waiver getting granted. I don't think should be completely overlooked because at the very least this guy could be solid not turn the ball over lean on a great defense um and i think some of the other guys in that room could do that as well and if you want to if you want to say okay what's your your weakest spots on the roster it might be wide receiver right now i know you have colson loveland at tight end you can throw the ball to donovan edwards samaj morgan tyler morris they're promising you know fred morris promising so is carmelo english guys like that but you don't have a ton of experience there well maybe alex orgy is a guy who okay well let's go with the run heavy formation or, you know, option with Alex orgy at quarterback. So that's an option. If you have a great defense, you at least have something to hang your hat on and you can be pretty good uh, if not really good. So yeah, there's still a lot of hope for, uh, for the season, obviously. And we'll see what they do in the transfer portal because rosters do not look the same February 19th as they do, you know, August 31st when they kick off against Fresno state. I already can't wait, but, uh, yeah, so it's still a long way to go, but certainly a lot of promise. And maybe don't rule out, let's just say that it's Tuttle and Orgy at the top. Maybe you have a two QB system. Um, I maybe, could see you know, it. Maybe, yeah, it's... maybe they redefine what a starting quarterback looks like, as Jim Harbaugh said they might do before 2019, before he just played Shea Patterson the whole year, which, by the way, was the right <laughs> call. But. Yeah. Uh, gosh, throw, shout out to Dan Valari, who's now a tight end anyways, right? And Alex, the kick returner, Alex Orgy, too. Oh my gosh. I was waiting for that to revolutionize the kick return game. And maybe, maybe that's still in the cards for this year. I don't know, but uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, let's move on now. Uh, before we move on to our Q&A segment again, uh, that is wide open. So feel free to get your questions in during the chat, but want to talk to 
talk about our pals over at Lewis Jewelers, of course. Simple question, guys. Uh, is your daughter's engagement ring better than your bigger than your wife's? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. Great news. Lewis Jewelers can help. It's a stress-free way uh, to work with one of their non-commissioned expert trusted advisors. Finding that perfect diamond. So stop by today. Fix this family issue. Lewis Jewelers, your diamond store, and so much more since 1921. Visit them at their new location over at 300 South Maple Road in Ann Arbor or online at lewisjewelers.com. Thank you kindly to Lewis Jewelers for your continued support of our show and of the Wolverine at large. Let's move into those questions now. Uh, I'm going to start with this one from P. Maximus, who says, guys, who do you see being our third linebacker this year? Is it Jimmy Rolder, Micah Pollard, Jaden Hood? They really haven't shown too much except for on special teams. Of course, we know Ernest Hausman and Jay Sean Barham. You're likely two starting linebackers, but where do you think it goes from here, Clay? I would guess Jimmy Rolder. You know, I think the injury set him back last year, but he was going to have more of a role. We saw him at the end of the year when they decided to redshirt him, play him in four regular season games. So I would go with Jimmy Rolder, but Jaden Hood's a guy who made a move in fall camp last year. Um, you know, Micah Pollard's a guy who's really stood out on the kickoff team in the past. They were impressed with him in his first fall camp a couple of years ago, he needed to put on weight. He has put some on. So they do have sneakily more depth there than maybe you would think. I think just because those guys can play, but I think that the next guy in line who could be the guy who played the Ernest Hausman role last year would be Jimmy Rolder to me, just based on where he seems to be in, uh, in the pecking order. But again, it's going to be clean slate. Brian uh, Jean Marie is coming in as the linebackers coach and you know, it's, you know, it's going to be a clean slate. By the way, he recruited Jaden Hood, got him out of St. Thomas Aquinas in Florida. So they have that connection. He was his primary recruiter and he knows some of these guys. So it's going to be uh, interesting to see, you know, who that is. But uh, you lose a lot in that linebacker room. Luckily, I mean, the addition of Barham was was massive. It was massive. Uh, again, I, I like what they have at the top. I think with any of these guys, maybe namely Rolder and Jaden Hood, and I'm not ruling out Micah Pollard yet. We just haven't seen him play. Um, I know the staff, or at least uh, you know the early returns on a guy like Cole, Cole Sullivan, even just in those bowl uh, practices, a lot of people I like the way he moves with him. Yeah, yeah, he, he moves really well, and I think that really their athleticism at linebacker, uh, the way that they found ways to get more athletic there over the last few years since uh, Jean Marie has actually been at Michigan or left. Uh, Michigan for Tennessee has been pretty impressive. So uh, we'll see if they keep uh, keep that up on the recruiting trail. But I like what they have there. I think linebacker, again, a lot of the questions that they'll have on defense really isn't a matter of, you know, are these guys capable? It's just how deep they will ultimately be because they really did a great job over these last few years cultivating that depth. And uh, whether it be with guys via the transfer portal, whether it be some of those diamonds in the rough on the recruiting trail, but like what they have on that side of the ball, certainly. Uh, let's go to John Walls, who had a comment about the quarterbacks. He said, not sure why people are pushing for a transfer. I like the guys we have. Build them up. They have been in the system two to three years. It doesn't make sense to bring a new guy in. And then John Walls says, which transfer uh, QB played great for their team that went to a whole new staff? Now, I would say, before I defer to you, Clayton. Every transfer goes to a whole new staff. But Every transfer does go to a whole new staff, but this is also basically the same offensive brain trust that Michigan has operated with for at least since last year uh, with more with Kirk Campbell. Obviously Jim Harbaugh had a huge hand in that, but um, I think I would trust their judgment on it, especially given the fact that they're going to have that four five, six weeks, however long it is to find out if they need to go get some, if they need, if they think they need to go get someone, they will put out the word, but, if someone becomes available, I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't know who the target would be right now because I don't like speculating about guys that aren't available yet. So, yeah, I mean, I understand what, what John's saying. I mean, you kind of have what you have roll with them, develop them. But I think in today's college football, one, you can do that while also looking at the transfer portal, assessing what options are out there and maybe bringing somebody in and competition cannot hurt. I mean, competition, can only help of course you got to keep the dynamic of the room you know tight you got to make sure that you have good chemistry on the offense and the team as a whole but I mean in today's college football you don't have a guarantee from your players that they're going to stay 
and you have to feel the best possible team that you can. So if you feel that getting a transfer is the right thing at any position, you have to go do it. You have no guarantee they're going to, you know, your guys are going to stay. So they could leave at any point. We saw it with Keon Sab last week. Again, I'm not blaming anybody for making a, a choice, but I also don't blame these coaching staffs whose jobs are on the line, you know, each and every year and they need to produce uh, for going and getting guys because you need the, you know, the best possible player you can get uh, on the field, somebody who can help you win uh, as much as possible. So I, I think that I understand that, but uh, you have to, you have to find a guy that's going to give you the best chance to win at the most important position on the field and in the, in sports really. Let's go to Jackson Ross, who says, uh, and again, sometimes I'm not comfortable discussing coaching targets for a job that's not open yet, but for the purposes of this show, we'll do it. Uh, Jackson asks, who are a few coaches you would like to target to replace Juwan? And I will say, we'll just say if Ju if there is a opening to fill. Um, I mean, I mean, we did it with I, football. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I want to hear your guys because there's some overlap there. I know we talk about Dusty May all the time. Some people talk about Chris Collins. Are you saying we've talked about this before? Uh, not, not officially, but it may have come up a time or two, uh, you know, during TV timeouts or what have you. But uh, for <laughs> me, I think that uh, Steve Peichel is a guy that I like a lot, but I know he's got those ties there at Rutgers and kind of kind of has them rolling right now, uh, at least on the recruiting trail. Uh, it seems like there's signs of life on the court for them, uh, at least a little bit over the last uh, recently, of course, but Dusty May, I guess uh, Chris Collins is, is a candidate that people like. Um, I don't think Brian Dutcher is going to be an option. I don't think that, I just don't think that's realistic at all. Well, who are the guys that stick out to you? Yeah. So one, I think when you talk about Dusty May, he's a guy who was a manager at Indiana under Bob Knight. And I, I looked down you know, a little bit south in Bloomington and see a similar situation. Like, I think they may move on from Mike Woodson and that would complicate things for Michigan as it did when, you know, Jim Harbaugh takes guys, John Harbaugh needs a DC, Mike McDonald needs a DC, you know, on the football side of things, you know, the Michigan and Indiana candidate pool would kind of overlap a little bit. So I think that's where it gets complicated. I mean, Porter Moser has always been a guy that I think people have looked at as a potential replacement for any Michigan coach down at Oklahoma isn't winning maybe as much as you would like at this point. He's somebody, I know someone in the chat here on YouTube mentioned Chris Collins is somebody I, I think Chris Collins is a great, uh, Chris Collins is, is a very good coach. He's done good things at Northwestern. It's helped that boo booey has stick, uh, stuck around for 11 years there. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, he's on the he Perry Ellis plan. Yeah, he is. And he just keeps I, I don't know if he has another year or not. I don't think he does. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's done some good things there. He's taken them to the tournament at a place that never gets there. Uh, I don't think ever got there before he brought them there. So he's somebody. But, yeah, th those are a few names that come up. And look. I'm not saying Jawan Howard's not going to be here next year. I mean, we talked about it with football potential names that you could replace Jim Harbaugh with. You know, we talked about that even when this team was heading into college football playoff games. So I think it's always fair game. Ward Manuel ad admitted after Sharon Moore was hired that he had a list of people that he was potentially always going to talk to if Michigan had an opening. You would imagine uh, a proactive leader would want to have that as well, On you know, for most sports, including the big ones. So I don't think it's unfair for anyone to talk about potential guys because – I mean, people probably talked about it when John Beeline was here. You know, who's going to succeed him one day? And uh, so Ward you know, Manuel that, did. After Beeline yeah. interviewed with the Pistons, uh, he said that he had a list of guys. Right. That he was so, I mean, and you have to. So, you know, it's during TV timeouts, we can formulate a list as well. It's fair game. We don't, I mean, we have skin in the game in terms of covering the team, but ultimately uh, we are not qualified to make those decisions. So. Uh, always a fun hypothetical, uh, even though the state of the team is not very fun. Uh, P Maximus says, are we going with Adam Samaha as our starting place kicker or dipping into the portal again? I would lean towards him being the guy. Um, you know, last year, the buzz in the spring was that maybe Tommy, Dom uh, maybe Tommy Doman was going to do both. And they wound up bringing in James Turner, which was an extremely underrated home run addition as far as I'm concerned. But uh, Samaha, I think, is is 
probably, you know, we'll, we'll see. It might be a situation where another, I think you're evaluating this entire roster in spring ball, because I think there are going to be guys that become available anywhere and everywhere you could possibly need them. So uh, I would lead Samaha. I don't know that, uh, you know, I think if there was a lack of confidence in him getting the job done or lack of confidence in any of those guys getting the job done, I know uh, Hudson Hollenbeck was someone they brought on as a walk-on last year uh, to come in and compete for that down the road. So, you know, if there was any doubt that they didn't have the guys, uh, I think maybe that there would have been some sort of courtship, but um, I think that's something if, if they need to make an addition, it would be after spring ball. Yeah. And, and you know, we don't know if the philosophies changed there or, you know, what JB Brown now feels about the, what he has in the special teams room, because it's a new position coach, you know, Jay Harbaugh is not here anymore. So, uh, you know, from one portal period to the next, you have a different coach. So that could change the dynamic as well. It is kind of interesting. I do wonder if Tommy Doman's going to go back in practice this spring at place kicker. We all know he was the holder for James Turner last year, but he's not the holder for left-handed Adam Samaha, at least during practices last season, that was Hudson Hollenbeck. So, it could actually free him up to kick and you kind of battle between him and Samaha. I would imagine that happens in the spring. You know, I mean, Doman learned how to, to uh, hold. He had never done it before until last summer, just before fall camp. And he did a good job. I thought throughout the season. So I think he could go back to that if you need him to, but I would imagine those two would be kicking Hollenbeck would hold. And um, you know, at least for Samaha, maybe somebody else does for Doman. Who's a right hand, uh, right footed kicker. And then, you know, but I, I would imagine you would look in the portal and I think guys will guys will come open and you can also say, hey, look at what James Turner did last year. Like he may get picked or get picked up at least as an undrafted free agent. And he made some massive kicks at Michigan. He'll re be remembered forever. I mean, he hit four against Ohio State. I mean, another what, four or five against Iowa the next week. So he was huge. And you can sell that, I think. And Michigan has a decent track record now of producing kickers. So I think that it's going to be appealing, you know, and we'll see what, I mean, on the recruiting trail, this is a, this has been a program that's been willing to continue to use scholarships on that when a lot of teams sure, yeah. don't do that and have to deal with missed kiss, missed, missed kicks every single week. And especially in big moments. So, um, Adam Samaha is a guy that was brought in on scholarship. I think that they in theory should be okay. There, uh, haven't really had to throw guys, into the fire right away, uh, which has been nice. So uh, the fact that he's got a, you know, he has that year now under his belt uh, to kind of see and learn, I think is good. And I would expect it uh, to be him. Uh, another one from P Maximus who says, who will be our blocking tight end replacing AJ Barner? Uh, Bredesen is more of a motion fullback. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be another group where I think there's competition there because you've got Colston Loveland there. I think there are certainly, you know, I think, he's pretty safely going to be a pretty highly drafted tight end when it's time, his time to go to the NFL, but uh, blocking typically determines what that upside looks like. And I think there are strides that he can and has taken there. Um, but outside of that, I know uh, Zach Marshall and, and Marlon Klein are still kind of more pass catchers too. Uh, so there is a, uh, it's tough to plan a flag there because there's a lot of guys that need to improve given that that room is, is clearing out a bit. Yeah, it, it's tough to say. I would imagine that we see Max Bredesen in line a little bit more than we did last season. I think you know, we actually saw him do a little bit more of that in 2022. You didn't need him to as much a year ago. It's crazy to say a year ago when talking about the 2023 team, but a few months ago at least uh, with um, well, because Barner was there and Barner was so good. Barner rated out as the top run blocking tight end in the entire country with a minimum of, I forget how many snaps, but a respectable amount of snaps, right? Guys who played a lot. And I think Max Bredesen was number two. So we know he can do it, but I would think, I think we see Max Bredesen in line more. I know that limits you a little bit because he's not as much of a threat as a pass catcher, but um, you know, this brings a big opportunity for guys like Marlon Klein, who I think is big enough to do that. I just don't know one way or the other, if he's a good enough blocker right now to take on that role, but to me, when you see him out there, he looks like he he's big enough to to play that role at some point. If uh, and, and Grant Newsom said, even coming into last year, he said he grouped Marlon Klein in that group of guys that he trusted that could play in games. Luckily for Michigan, they stayed healthy there and didn't have to see him. But I think he he's a guy that you know people have forgotten about a little bit. So I'm excited to see him 
in the spring game and kind of hear about how he progresses this spring. And we'll go to one more from P Maximus because this has become his segment here to close out our show. A lot of special teams is, and blocking. I love it. I love it. Love blocking talking ball. Love talking. Love talking about special teams on a February nineteenth, a cold February nineteenth evening. I says outside of Samaj Morgan, who else will be returning punts and kickoffs? Uh, Tyler Morris, I think, would be in play for that. Cole Cabana, assuming good health, I think would be in play for that. Uh, Carmelo English was in that punt return mix last year. So those are a few names off the top of my head. I think Ben Hall could probably return kicks. Cole Cabana, uh, as you mentioned, could return kicks. I mean, to me, Samaj was kick returner before he became punt returner. Then he did a good job against Iowa, right, with his punt return. He muffed the one against Alabama, as we all know. But I, I don't think that's going to be an issue for him moving forward. There's no indication that that he's that, you know, has has that issue. So other than the one time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would think Samaj Morgan probably plays both of those roles, but yeah, you, you mentioned the guys, uh, otherwise that would probably compete for him. I know. I, I think I have, uh, is it a Marion Stewart, uh, who was a slot guy out of the recruiting class? Wouldn't be surprised. To, I know EJ has liked him as, as a potential punt returner as well. So that might be a guy to keep an eye on. Um, question wise, I think that's going to do it. Um, uh, Let's get out of here then. Let's close things out again. Thank you guys for jumping on. Uh, covered a lot of ground this evening. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, have that, have our content sent right to your pocket. Uh, that's the best way to do things. Just have us right there all the time. And if you want to use your experience here in the podcast feed or on YouTube to get yourself some premium access to the website, use that promo code UM1 to get two months of access for a dollar. Again, remember to head over to the WolverineOnDemand.com and get your copy of the commemorative national title edition of our magazine. If you haven't done so already, if you have, I'll uh, look for that in your mailbox, hopefully soon. I think those are going to start going out here um, ASAP. So uh, for Clayton Safey, for producer Megan behind the scenes, I'm Anthony Broom. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. And we will talk to you again next time. <laughs>